close this session, uh, we had the idea of sharing with you some of the things that we are doing, uh, tweaking a little bit uh, some of the tools that we already had uh, to be able to apply for the original uh, control project. So this is uh, still a work in progress, so feedback is very welcome, really. Uh, and it's uh, the product of a lot of people working, uh, not only from my team and the Pure Solutions team in, in BI, but other people that have uh, give, given us a lot of uh, input. Dr. Holcomb and Dr. Paulson uh, did a great job leading this uh, committee and coming up with a very standardized way of classifying, categorizing cell farms depending on their first virus infection status. And, and that's a an starting point classification that we have uh, to be able to talk the same language to sample uh, with the minimal standards uh, and, and understand each other and understand what is happening in, in, in a specific area. When we were trying to apply those uh, categories from positive and three different levels, provisionally negative or negative, to our uh, push control projects and systems and flows or in regions, then we found some uh, limitations or, or challenges that motivated us to think a little bit uh, more about that and, and come up with different options or uh, additions to that classification. So basically, uh, we, we try to say, well, let's start with this uh, beginning classification, let's not change it, and let's adapt it or uh, make it useful for those uh, systems or regions working with burst control. So let me go back to this one second. So the traditional uh, or, or this uh, ASV classification uh, will give you the, the traditional maps that we have been seeing from uh, Enrique, Dr. Morrison, Spencer, in the university, so red will be positive, and green will be negative, and blue will be unknown. And triangles are usually used for saw farms, squares for nurseries, and rounds or circles for, for finishing sites. Then one of the first uh, questions that we got was, well, uh, Purse virus uh, status, as, as you just heard Dr. Brown said, telling you the story about last week, is very dynamic. It changes a lot over time. So it's, the question is, where, how long does that green dot remain green? And how often do we need to sample that green dot to be sure it's green? And how can we have a system that will allow us to uh, understand what is happening in the region over time? So the, the real question was, how can we integrate the herd classification with the surveillance programs that we were applying in the field? So this is. Uh, one of the th thing, first challenges that we had is incorporating that uh, this classification or adaptation of the classification to the surveillance programs that were happening in the field. And Dr. Ransom just mentioned the process and Sonia uh, and Dr. Lola did it earlier. The second challenge, the second major uh, issue was that uh, more poor control projects are happening in the states and systems or regions and therefore uh, a bigger need for mapping, GIS tools using is happening in the States. So more people are trying to come up with their maps and they all want different uh, ideas and they have different uh, opinions on how the map will be more informative for them. So we were concerned that at a given point we will get uh, different uh, maps, different uh, styles of maps, uh, different colors and, or symbols that will be very hard for us to combine or integrate the information later on and be able to use that information to understand uh, the success of, of those projects. So one of the objectives that we had then was come up with a standardized method for uh, including visualization and analysis in those uh, classification parameters. And the third one is uh, kind of a very complex situation that we have is that a red dot won't let you know too much about risk. You just know that that farm is positive, but you don't know too much about the risk that that farm poses to other farms in the region or in the same cluster, or a green dot, what risk is that farm exposed from red dots around it. So it's how can we incorporate risk into this uh, classification and surveillance program to make it more informative and useful for people taking the decisions in the field. So let's go to the same uh, map that we had the, at the beginning, a hypothetical map here. So you can see this region in the left 
of a map here. I was sitting there, so I'll use this map now. You guys can see here. Uh, the left of, of the map, we have a lot of positive farms surrounded this negative uh, south farm. So how can we know if any of those are vaccinated sites or are not shedding anymore? Or how can we get more information out of that map so these people in this region can take decisions on their peak flow, a vaccination decision, biosecurity, or uh, things that they can do to prevent that south farm to get infected. So the objectives of coming up with this adaptation of the classification were uh, first to transform a little bit or adapt the current uh, ter terminology of classifying swine herds to meet the needs for air regional control projects. So you guys working in the field in these regional control projects were the customers that were asking for uh, new technologies or tools to be applied. Second, to incorporate the, the use of, of first modified live virus vaccines into the classification, because at this time, we don't have uh, any distinction between a positive side that is only field virus or a positive side that is only vaccine virus. And third, as I said before, to provide a simple and standardized color and symbol code to visualize first virus status in those farms. So this is what, what we did. The first disclosure here is this is a work in progress, so please feel free to give us feedback uh, Tell us what you don't like, what you like, if you can apply it. And the idea is to have a live document and evolve with the needs that we have in the field. I will be, you, you saw Dr. Lola presented a whole table. It's a very busy table, so I'll be showing it by sections. The first column here, the far left, is the ASV category classification. So you have the, the positive, honest table, uh, as, as category one, then we have the 2B, the three, and the four categories in that first column. So we, we keep that, and we want to keep that to be consistent with, uh, with what uh, ASV category uh, paper has, has done before. So we don't want to change that, but we want to add or split that positive category into multiple categories so it's a little bit more informative to people using those maps in the field or those uh, classifications in the field. Unknown, uh, now we are putting that in the top of the risk level in that table. Then positive, which is only positive for field virus. If a farm has field virus but it's also vaccinated or a vaccinated farm gets field virus, then we call it positive vaccinated. And if a farm is vaccinated and was negative before and you didn't have evidence of field virus, then you call it positive, uh, negative vaccinated. Then we combine the stable, sorry, the positive stable are provisionally negative into one uh, to the, uh, the, the practical point of a person doing the project, uh, they just want to know if they are sending positive pigs out, and that's just for breeding herds. And then we have the negative category, which is very easy uh, to establish and to, to define. So if you see the table, you can see that the, the risk scale will go from the lower, lowest risk to the highest risk in this direction. So from bottom, probably highest risk. So you can see that we are classifying unknown farms as the most challenging farms or the highest risk farms in a region. And there are two reasons for that. One, because you have to assume that they are positive, and two, because they are not yet ready to share or testing, which make it very dangerous because you won't be uh, aware of what is happening in those farms. We have some uh, definition for every one of those I just mentioned briefly. And then we have like diagnostic requirement. What, what it means, and we try to uh, write that in the same uh, way that the ASV paper is organized, is what do you need to move from a highest risk category to a lower risk category? So what samples do you need to take to prove that you are not uh, stable now, that you are, <coughs> sorry, negative? Or that you are, uh, you had vaccine in your farm and now you are free of that vaccine. So that's, that's the idea of the diagnostic requirements and it follows the same standards uh, that, that ASV paper was following. Maybe the only difference is in these vaccine categories where we include the sequencing into those uh, same PCR testing that we had before just to uh, 
be sure that vaccine was not there. So this is our hypothetical map. One more time, this is how it, it would look with the ASV classification now, and this is what it will look with the proposal classification. So, and this is a hypothetical uh, example. I just made it up. But you can see that in some cases, the risk that this soft arm was exposed is, is much lower than what you would expect or saw with the previous, previous classification, previous symbology. So it's a matter of uh, giving tools to those guys managing flows or deciding if they apply vaccine or deciding if they depopulate a farm or if they have to do something with their soft farms so they can take better informed decisions on what to do in those specific sites. Challenges, a lot of challenges. I just put three in there. Uh, the first one is we have to uh, keep working, and Dr. Morrison mentioned the working group that Dr. Paulson is leading, and to incorporate oral fluids into the sampling uh, standards or the sampling uh, recommendations. And this is very important. And then also we have to incorporate oral fluids into the hair classification, because so far it's based mostly on, on serum. The second one is that somehow, and I understand it's very complicated, but somehow we have to get to a point where we are a little bit more flexible on allowing practitioners in the field to play a little bit with frequency and number of samples. The reason is, and I know that that was a big discussion in the committee, is that uh, the, the minimal recommendations are at least 30 serum samples of due to be wind peaks every month. What about for four times? And then you, you can call that farm stable. What about if I take 60 samples every week for four weeks? That's it. Is it comparable? So we have to allow those veterinarians that are under a lot of pressure of moving gills in or changing flows in the field to provide them with the tools to have the same confidence level to change the status of those farms. And it has to be scientifically proven. It has to be uh, robust enough so they can be comfortable using that. And the last one is we have to improve uh, the way that we are gathering, analyzing, and visualizing risk. And in those, in not only in the maps, but in the classification, the surveillance program. So we, are, we have the risk assessment tool. The PADRAP system is a tremendous tool that we have. But we are not incorporating that into her classification or into surveillance programs. And that's something that we need to do because as Dr. Morrison was explaining all this, uh, <laughs> sorry, risk-based surveillance, it'll be really different to uh, apply uh, surveillance to different flows depending on the risk that they are exposed to. And that'll be uh, positive to increase the efficiency where how we use the resources of that region.